So, <sighs> The Tyranny of Dragons was written when D&D 5e originally came out. And I realized the warnings that I got when I first picked up this book. Actually, let me phrase that. I picked up the book and then found all of the warnings that could make this. The biggest change that I made in this current one, if you've ever actually played the Tyranny of Dragons uh, through either as a player or as a character, is that after Waterdeep, you were supposed to get back on the road again and travel by wagon even further for like another week. We've just done a month of wagon travel. Who wants more wagon travel? I'm all for it. I know that characters need to get around, but by this point, characters are high enough level that I really feel like there should have been something different happening, or just not more wagon travel. I was burned out on wagon travel. I was burned out. I know it was a different type of travel, like before you're with a caravan, and now you're traveling with a work crew that's going to go build the road that is going around the mirror that's being modified to go further on the, the expanding mirror of the dead men. But it's still more wagon travel so in my brain the easiest fix to this was instead of going to the roadhouse warehouse thing where everything was being stored and then working on the road where they then were moving the the horde of treasure around i just took that and made it a warehouse inside waters deep and just said that you know what the mirror of the dead man is expanded enough that it's at the borders it is like you are if you look out the northern border of waters deep a mile or so mile or two out you see the mirror of the dead men creeping closer to the city that makes more sense to me now we're not we can jump straight into the mirror of the dead men bypass another week's worth of travel uh now granted there was supposed to be some more cult action going on but I really got thinking about it. I'm like, okay, so we're putting this in a warehouse that they're then going to pass the gold off to somebody else to carry it on. It's a locked, fortified warehouse. You don't really need much people. So at that point is where the rest of the cult drops the gold off. It's handed off to the final watch person in the fortified warehouse for the lizard men to grab. And the cult moves on to its next mission. The cult is dispersed to go do whatever it is that the next part that that group is supposed to do. Since it's supposed to be a segmented, uh, uh, you know, a segmented group, right? The cult is supposed to be, you know, cellular and, and not know what everybody else is doing. So they hand it off to Bog. Bog is the one supposed to watch it. And when Nahis stepped up and started wanting to flirt with the other half-orc, I was not turning it down. So... Anyway, flirting with the and now you get where we're at. So they're flirting, they get into the cabin, and then so now that's where the biggest point. We're not jumping, we're not going that far. They're in the mirror of the dead men. We can jump right into the canoe trips, we can jump right into the, the battle, the 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 travel in dangerous terrain. I mean, because the mirror of the dead men is dangerous. Um and I really feel like unfortunately for my players, I didn't kind of do that, which is why the crocodile attack just suddenly happened like almost out of nowhere, because they were no longer on the safe traveling place. Uh, so, yeah, I wanted them to get that feeling that there could be other things attacking them. And the crocodile wasn't supposed to just go after one party member, but when one party member just flies right over and kind of pokes it in the nose, you let the crocodile eat the party member. So, uh, what else can I say that I changed about this? Um, I can't say too much more about what's actually changed in this without giving it away for the players because they're still playing out some of this. Uh, but I will point out some great interactions that I want to point out. Having the bard and an ancient red, dra an ancient black dragon, have a dispute or have an argument, negotiation, go back and forth was so awesome and so satisfying. I loved that engagement. Um, that I felt like it really did. They were playing up to the dragon's own desires and the dragon, you know, feeding into his ego kind of thing. It was really, it was a great example of some really great role playing. Uh, the other thing I'm going to focus on, I'm going to use the last little bit here, is to focus on, uh, the, I guess, the DM tip I want to pull away from the behind-the-scenes bit. Um, oh, wait, let me make sure I'm covering all my notes here. Oh, okay, so the other thing that I did change, though, was adding the Black Dragon in. He's not even mentioned. You're having a, you have a game, okay, you have a campaign. That is all about dragons, right? It's the tyranny of dragons. And you have the party walking through the Mirror of Dead Men where there's an ancient black dragon known to reside and you don't bring it in? 
I'm sorry. I couldn't let that slide. I put that in. So this black dragon and the quests that he, the side quests that are given to the party, this is all out of book. This is all... Now, granted, I got some great suggestions from Sly Flourish's write-up on this campaign about throwing this in and really using the Mirror of the Dead Men. And I agree with his write-up that the Mirror of the Dead Men is an awesome place. I mean, this setting is great. I could write an entire campaign just in the Mirror of the Dead Men. Um, awesome. And to have it just so blatantly bypassed by the book was just, I felt, ah, just, <sighs> anyway, you get the point. So, Ancient dra Black Dragon, side quest to get the Black Dragon on your side, that's awesome. So, within this, though, I want to focus uh, the DM tip about the fact that this campaign had a major change from one of the characters mid-campaign. The, play, the characters are all, right now, I want to say level 7. And during all of this, we had a meeting as a, a game group. We realized maybe we weren't all on the same page. We needed to have a meeting, and which is another great thing, by the way. Don't feel bad that as a party, um, if you are not a group of, of players, if you're a group of players that have not played a lot with each other, don't feel bad about having another session zero. Um, this party... We had gotten together, we'd had at least one player swap out and another player add in. Like, when we first started playing, Fire wasn't part of this. She came in in Chapter 3. Uh, at halfway through Chapter... Or most of the way through Chapter... Or halfway through Chapter 1, we had... Uh, we had Lilith swap characters uh, and go from playing her Ranger to playing the Bard. Um, and so, I mean, the party had a little bit of change-up uh, in the time... And we lost a party member, too. Uh, anyway... We're now chapter four, chapter five, and the party wasn't quite, the players were not getting along. So we stopped. We had an entire session game night where we all sat around and we talked about it and we had a, a real good heart-to-heart -heart talk about what uh, what the players wanted out of the game, what the characters wanted out of the game, and kind of refresh it all in everybody's heads. It had been months. And we also had taken a big break when the, when the world decided to fall apart around us. So it was kind of good. So there's another point. Just don't feel bad having to stop and kind of go, okay, guys, let's all get back on the same page. Let's all make sure we're all playing for the same reasons and we, you know, we can help each other achieve the goals, either party or player or, or character goals. Um, it was a great time. But when this happened, one of the players, uh, Ember, who plays Fire, decided that she made a comment to me or made a comment during that that she really feels like she wishes she could do more and that she could do the way I took it was like be in two places at once. And that got my brain firing. So after we get done with that meeting, I started texting her back and forth. I said, okay, so you want to be in two places at once. Well, I read up on this great little multi-class. Now this is, by the way, Fire is 12. This is her first D&D campaign. This is her first character. And I would normally, under normal circumstances, never, ever, 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 ever suggest that you multi-class a first person, a first character. But... This is my exception to that rule. I looked, we talked about it. We said, look, you want to do this. If we add two levels of cleric to you, I'll let you get a bit more healing. You can let Arkin off the hook for having to be the healer all the time. And you guys can maybe split the duties of being a you know, party healer. And it'll allow you to, if you take uh, the, the trickster, you can get this cool ability called the called duplicity which allows you to take make another illusion of yourself that can cast spells through or as a rogue having the duplicate with you gives you advantage on your attack rolls which means you automatically get your sneak attack bonuses without i mean uh, it's a great combo somebody had read about it, i read about it in, and i read it or on twitter or something somebody was talking about great multi-classes so, we talked about it, and I said, I will help you out. I'm going to help you run this character. I'll help make sure you know what you're doing. I have no problem helping walking you through this. She agreed. I made the tweaks to her character. Now, to do this, I did have to tweak her character a bit. Her character did not have the high enough wisdom to technically multi-class in Wizard. But she really, really loved this idea. So what? We tweaked it a little bit. So, you know, she lost a little bit of constitution. We threw a couple more points uh, from some of her earlier allocations into wisdom. I think we ended up switching two stat blocks. Uh, I think I swapped her... Uh, I think I ended up swapping intelligence and wisdom to get it so it was a little bit higher. We used um, the... Not point by, but uh, the standard array whenever we made their characters at the very beginning of this game. So I swapped those around, got her to 13 so that she could do this. 
Yeah, uh, who cares? So we had to make changes to the character. But you know what? When she was able to surprise her own mother by her opening action when they were attacking the bone golem by going, I are attacking the, the cultists with the necromancer. I cast duplicity and I laid that second miniature on the table in front of everybody. All everybody was in shock or awe or like, wait, what the hell's happening here? And then we explain that she has been actually studying a little bit of priest in the background. She's now a part-time cleric. You know, she's been uh, praying to Bast, and Bast decided to grant her some, spe to give her some cleric. You know what? The player's happy. The party's happy. The party thought it was awesome. She used it well. She actually mostly did the whole running around together with her illusion and using it to give her to get her bonuses. Totally awesome. Uh, the player's happier. The party's happier. And isn't that why we play these games? Um, this is her first character. So when, you know, you, you create your first character, you may not understand or know of all the options that are available to you. And you might not come across them because a lot of times, and I'm even guilty of this too, uh, when a player comes to me uh, and says, I want to play D&D for the first time, my first reaction actually is not to even talk about class or race or anything. I ask them, who do you want to play? Like, is there a is there an archetype that you already know? Is there a personality, a character uh, from a story, from a movie that you want to be? I start there, and then we build the character they want to play around that. I know all of the mechanics, but who do you want to be? Do you want to be Robin Hood? Do you want to be Mad Max? Do you want to be, uh, uh, I don't know, Cheryl Crow? And I... I who cares? What, whatever the concept is you have in your head, let's find that out and then make the character. Uh, and that's... But to then, you, you, you don't know. And so when she said that, and she, and I explained that she could do this, and she was all about it. So normally, yes, I would totally say don't multi-class. Unless, as a DM, you are willing to be that DM that's going to help them and send them notes. I am going to be in constant contact with Ember from now on about her character so that fire can be played properly. Um, whenever she levels, I'll help give her the points of which way she should, you know, if you go this way, you can do this. If you go this way, you can do that. And I'll let her decide if she's going to keep going more rogue or more cleric. It's going to be up to her. Uh, we're going to see. It's. I feel like this is going to be a great combination. The and, and again, where is it written that you can't make that happen? This is a game. This is for the enjoyment of everybody. Her making these slight stat changes and, you know, buffing up or not buffing up and, and making it... It doesn't break the campaign for me. It, in fact, it doesn't break anything for me as the DM. Nothing is going to change in how I'm going to run this campaign because she changed her character. Uh, does the party dynamic end up changing a little bit? It does, but I think, again, for the better, because, uh, you know, the Arkin doesn't feel like she has to be the healer uh, all the time, and now she has somebody she can, other than the Bard, the Bard also has been taking a, a few healing spells too, so now we're spreading the healing out, so it's not all on one person. Uh, I do know that they, that can burn people out. If you if you have to feel like you can't spend your spell slots on other abilities or other things, you've got to keep being able to heal people, uh, then you kind of feel like you don't, you're don't, you not being as effective as you want. Um, so yeah, there's my DM tip. Uh, it's a game. Let's have fun with it. Make the changes. Mid-game, who cares? Um, it's still technically within the rules. And I feel like it's just going to help everybody out in the long run. Uh, it was an awesome change. I feel like it was really well received by everybody. And again, the shock and awe on everybody's faces when we threw a second to boxy rogue on the battlefield uh was just awesome so uh there's my dm tip uh for the or i should say the behind the scenes dm tip let your players make changes um if it's gonna be a major change maybe bring it up to the party but minor tweaks here and there let the let the characters make changes make the you know it i guess i'm gonna i'm gonna caveat that maybe higher end I know some people like to challenge themselves by not making stat changes or making any changes like that later on. But in the long run, are you having fun? Then do it. So that's going to be my DM tip for the rest of the night. There's my behind the scenes and behind the DM screen of running the Tyranny of Dragons. But there's a lot of other stuff I've got going on. But I'm going to open it up again. i got about eh, 
about six minutes left, so if anybody else has any questions about how this is being run, feel free to throw them up in the chat and my moderator right now, which is actually my daughter Lilith. Haha, uh, I will answer them. While we're waiting that to come up and for her to text me those to me or to them to pop up in the chat window, um, I'm going to give you a bit more rundown on the characters at the very end so that I have a little more filler. Arkin is our Anasi cleric who is trying to bring or find out what's been going on with all of the bird races. Uh, our half-orc barbarian, Nahis, uh, does not like to fight because she was made to fight as a child. So we have she has come out as a shield. She is a barbarian shield, uh, less as a, a, than a weapon. Um, she also, I would say, is... Uh, very good at flirting with other half orcs. We've kind of come to the point that half orcs are actually kind of rare in this version of the world. Uh, Callie is our halfling bard. Uh, Callie Boo has a very, very long name, which she gave me once, and I unfortunately have forgotten it. Um, but she, as a precursor, uh, also is looking to make a good name for herself, but also looking to find out a little bit more about uh, the world and bring it back to her family. Um, oh, side note. Anybody else remember what happened to Timothy? Oh, let's see. Lu Tao, our way of the four elements monk who has passed his first ascension test and has a very powerful uh, staff of the elements. Um, strong character. Uh, there is some backstory there having to do with the Harpers, but we've, uh, we haven't really delved into that too much. Um... Let's see. Uh, oh, Remy. So this is the one that gives me conniptions, by the way. Remy is technically Remy 2.0. There is another Remy in a whole other dimension, another world, another universe that is in the Wandering Few campaign. And as we've been going through playing both of these, I still have trouble keeping track of which Remy knows what. And which Remy has what. As long as my wife can keep track of it, that's fine. But if I mess it up, I hope you guys all understand that I have two Remy's in two different universes and two different campaigns. Uh, let's see. Uh, last, uh, Fire. Fire the Tabaxi. So Fire the Tabaxi Rogue. Not a lot of backstory. Um, but I think we're all kind of figuring out exactly what kind of character she is. She definitely is a helper rogue. It's kind of that funny sound. So it's kind of interesting to see her play. Um, she loves the stealth and she loves the ability, but I do think she really was really wants to heal and do stuff like that. So, uh, the last one then I guess would be Eddie. Eddie's the kobold they picked up. Who's a ranger? A gloomstalker ranger. Um, Eddie's been a lot of fun actually. I wasn't anticipating Eddie being as much fun as he's been, um, because of the fact that uh, the party kind of forced that NPC to keep following him around. I guess I could have killed him off earlier. But, uh, or made it so he got lost at some point. I mean, they did abandon him at one point. But, uh, no, I think it's been kind of good having Eddie around. If nothing else, the party's becoming very, very attached to Eddie. So his death will be very memorable. All right. Well, I am seeing that there is no questions currently for the behind the DM screen stuff. Uh, by the way, I do want to thank my lovely wife, Callie. She did buy the backdrop for me because I will admit my very cluttered bookcases uh, were very cluttered. I need more space. But unfortunately, we're, I am building a game room in the basement right now where a lot of that stuff will eventually be stored nice and organized and I can show all that kind of stuff off. Next week, I will be talking back about the Wandering Few. We'll pick up where we left off. Uh, they uh, give you an idea. Um, by then, we should have found out what happens when that party got trapped in the hold of a cargo ship mid-mutiny. Uh, as for DM tips, I haven't come up exactly what's going to be happening. We'll talk about behind the scenes a bit more on a completely homebrewed case uh, created by myself. And we will talk a bit more about that one. Uh, as always, I am never going to try and do any of the commercials or anything like that. Uh, but if you would like to help me out, I do have a Patreon. Feel free to sign up for that. I'm going to be trying to produce some one-shots, uh, one-page one-shots for people to use, maybe just encounters even, based off of some of the stuff I've created for The Wandering Few, as well as The Tyranny of Dragons, or just some weird creations from my daughter. Uh, I also have a card game called The 5-Minute Sword Fight. You can purchase that down at uh, my Game Crafters link below, or you can always go to my Etsy store and order a Chainmail Dice Pouch. I do make custom Chainmail Dice Pouches. If you ever want to see what it takes to make a dice pouch i have a video up on my youtube channel that shows me making it in what normally would take me about two hours crammed down to about five minutes 
Thank you guys so much for checking this out and watching my video. I've been Haven the Hair, and may you make all of life's saving throws. So, with that, everybody, I have been Haven the Hair. Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I just read another comment from What What Man and it threw me off. Uh, some of the party, ah, uh, ah, uh, ha. Uh. Thanks so much. Anyway, that is the oh, end of their action. The fire, it is person. now on to you. Oh. Uh, after fire, we will have Callie. Do you want to cast what, what, a spell what, what, or do you what? want to shoot your bow? Actually, I have to do something. she's going to do something else. I am going to cast duplicity or whatever. Duplicity? Duplicity. duplicity. Where's the other mini? Duplicity. Wait, what? What is, what is duplicity? As she then concentrates, <laughs> she puts her hands out in front mimics a little bit of spell casting in the front of the air and a complete copy of fire appears what? where do you want to put it like no. right up in front okay a complete copy nice. shows up <laughs> in front of you guys a mirror image of fire has now entered the battlefield <laughs> that's sick that's yeah, what you were I want that. so that was just your action you still get to move and you have a bonus action. You can. Uh, you don't get to move uh, the mini yet, the other one yet, but that's next turn, but you can move yourself. Did you want to move forward too? Uh -huh. Okay, where are we moving yet to? Well, like next to you. Next to, next to you, okay. <laughs> a booming voice that almost feels like broken glass in your ears shrieks out as you guys, uh, as his the life leaves him. Your mission not done. Failure is only beginning. All the bones, all the bodies that, of all the cultists around you suddenly come sucking towards him. I need everybody to make a deck save. 